Hello, this is section 1.4 for Calc AB, and today we're going to be talking about continuity and one-sided limits. So first and foremost, the formal definition of continuity at a point is a function is continuous at C if the following three conditions are met. So f of C is defined, the limit as x approaches C of f of x exists, and the limit as x approaches C of f of x equals f of C. And there are visual explanations of why you need all three of these requirements to show that it's continuous at a point C. So down here, here's why you need the first one. So f of c needs to be defined. Well, you'll notice it fails step one because you do not have a defined value at c. So it's not continuous. You have to lift your pen or pencil off the page in order to connect these two points together, therefore not continuous. Now for this one, number two, so this one, notice the function's defined within the interval everywhere, but it fails step two where the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists. If you approach from the left and the right, your fingers are not going to come together. That limit does not exist. You're approaching different values from the left and the right. So it fails step two. And then the last visual here passes the first two steps. So the function's defined, yes. The limit exists. You, as you approach from the left and the right, your fingers would be coming together. You're approaching the same y value. But you can obviously see you'd have to lift your pencil, and there's where it fails the last step. The limit does not equal the function value. So anytime you have to say that something is continuous at a point, you need to make sure it meets these three requirements. Right? Now, there's two types of discontinuity. There's a removable discontinuity, and this is basically when the limit exists. So this would be up, this up here would be a removable discontinuity, okay? And then a non-removable discontinuity is when the limit does not exist. So that's something like this, where you have the limit approaches a different number from the left or the right, or you have an asymptote. The limit does not exist, and that's a non-removable discontinuity. And I want to point out up here. Continuity on an open interval, a function's continuous on an open interval if it's continuous at each point in the interval. And the key thing I want to point out is notice you're using an open interval. Um, continu continuity at endpoints, it varies in textbooks, but usually we, we're going to have open, open intervals for continuity. Okay, so this goes into some... So notice, if you start from left to right, where do we have parts on the graph where we have to lift our pencil? So if you start from the left, you're good to go until you get to x equals negative 2, where you have a non-removable discontinuity because it's an asymptote. Then you're continuous again until you get to 0, where you have another non-removable discontinuity. The limit does not exist. And then you're good to go again. You're continuous until you get to 2, where you have a removable discontinuity because the limit exists. And then the same thing here. So this is one where students get tripped up. It is not continuous. So that, and that's a removable discontinuity because the limit exists. And then when you get to here at three, did you have to lift your pencil in order to continue the function? You didn't have to lift your pencil, you're good to go. So that's continuous. But then at four, the limit does not exist. That's a non-removable discontinuity. You'd have to lift your pencil, right? Okay, so graph the following functions, determine whether the discontinuities are removable or non-removable. So in here, just make sure you reduce your function, graph the resulting function, just don't forget to put the open circle at negative one. And you have a vertical asymptote at three. So you can see you have a not you have a removable, excuse me, discontinuity at negative one, and you have a non-removable at three because of the asymptote. Now for your piecewise functions. <clears throat> graph all three within their intervals here. And again, we have that same scenario where you get to zero and you think, oh, something weird happens there, but I didn't have to lift my pencil off the paper, so we're good to go. But there is a non-removable at two. So, okay, now the existence of a limit is, and now we've actually already been talking about this. If you, the limit from the left is the same as the limit from the right, and notice there's an if and only if statement there. So the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l, if and only if, 
limit from the left and limit from the right both also equal L. And we've been we've actually been doing that a lot already. Um, find the limit of this function as x approaches zero from the left and from the right. And you'll notice from the left, and if you were to graph this on your graphing calculator, um, you can easily see what the graph looks like. You approach positive one fourth, but then from the right, you approach negative one fourth. Therefore, the limit does not exist. And then here, this is a step function, so you could graph that. To graph this on your graphing calculator, you have to type in int parenthesis x minus 2, and that will give you the step function. So, but approaching negative or 3 from the left, you get 0, and approaching 3 from the right, you get 1, so the limit does not exist. Okay, so definition of continuity on a closed interval. So this is where we're going to start to look at those endpoints. And a function is continuous on the closed interval if it's continuous on the open interval, first and foremost. And the limit as x approaches a from the right of our function equals f of a. And the limit as x approaches b from the left is equal to f of b. This one doesn't really pop up all that often. but And here's an example of something where the endpoints would be included. For, your, for this little semicircle here. Okay. Okay, so uh, now don't worry too, too much about it. You got bigger, bigger concepts coming that are going to show up or frequently. Okay, so properties of continuity. So when you start to multiply functions, add functions together, what happens? So multiplying by a scalar, you're still continuous. Um, it, Granted, f and g are continuous functions. So given that you have two continuous functions at c, multiplying by a scalar, it's still going to be continuous at c. Multiplying functions, you're still good to go. Composite functions, sum and difference. Quotient, as long, of course, as the denominator does not equal 0. And then the following types of functions are continuous at every point in their domains. So polynomial, rational, radical, trigonometric, and exponential and logarithmic. So all these functions, long, as long as you don't have the denominator equaling zero or with your trigonometric functions, be careful with graphs like tangent. Radical functions, be careful, make sure you're within the domain. You know, you're not getting a negative number under a even radical. So just as long as you're within the, in their domain, you're good to go. And what they're trying to point out is these are accepted continuous functions. So if you get to something like this, you don't have to prove that it's continuous. And we, that's accepted in the math world as common knowledge. All right, so this for these this big example group here, what I've done is I've graphed these functions for you and then wrote the continuity using interval notation. So for this one, I reduced it, graphed the function, continuity, so negative infinity to negative 3, union negative 3 to 3 over here, and then 3 to infinity. So that's what's happened. And then here, graphed this function. Now this is a function that's just been shifted to the right 3. This is kind of the, remember we called those basic ones parent functions. This isn't a parent function, but it's something that that's, that's what this is built off of. Graphed our tangent function here. And so for this one, you'll notice there's this has infinitely many places on this graph where it's discontinuous. So we just start with a dot, 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 negative 9 to negative 3 union, and then so forth. And then just develop that pattern and then end with a dot, dot, dot. And then for this piecewise function, it had actually a, a kind of little cute graph here. So it's a line everywhere except this middle um, space here. So this notation is just meant to save space, but absolute value of x minus or is less than 1 actually is x between negative 1 and 1. And in class we'll discuss, I'll, I'll remind you of the algebra skills and how that works. Remember the go la trick, if it's less than it's and, so it's between. If it's greater than it's an or, but that's where that's coming from. So this x was just graphed less than negative 1 or greater than 1. Those, that's these two parts. Okay. But you might see this notation, and that's just you have to pull from those algebra skills. Okay. Now, intermediate value theorem. This is a big one. Notice I put a big star on it. And notice up here with that 
definition of continuity, big star. You need to know this. When I was in calculus in high school, my calculus teacher made us write these three um, steps on almost every assessment for the definition of continuity. It's very important. Same with intermediate value theorem. So if f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, where f of a does not equal f of b, and k is any number between f of a and f of b, then there exists at least one number c in the interval a to b such that f of c equals k. Now, I know you're thinking, whoa, that's a lot. And why does Mrs. Cogswell have a picture of a chicken on my notes? So the idea is, if all of these conditions are met, so if you have a continuous function on a closed interval from A to B, so we'll use this picture here. From A to B, you have a continuous function. Okay, it meets the first requirement. The endpoints do not equal each other. All right, F of A does not equal F of B. We're good to go. And K is some number between F of A and F of B. So yeah, K is right here. It's between. If those three conditions are met, you are guaranteed this horizontal line is going to intersect your curve somewhere within that interval. And in this case, since we curved it around, it actually intersected three times. And that's where the chicken crossing the road comes into play. So if your chicken is trying to get from point A to point B, well, first of all, your chicken cannot fly. So we know it's going to be continuous. Your chicken's going to have to walk along the road. If we know for a fact that the chicken's trying to get from this point to another point across the road, that's this condition, and then the middle line of the road is your K, then you're guaranteed that, that chicken is going to cross that middle line in the, in the road. That's the whole idea. Okay, But those are the three conditions. So, and it's, it's, it should be pretty logical if you're trying to get from, and this is actually a really common one. If you have a positive Y value and you have a negative Y value, it must have crossed the X axis. That's where it's used, but it doesn't always have to be a positive and negative. Don't think it has to be where it crosses zero. It's just that K value is a horizontal line that we know for a fact it's gonna hit. So these are two examples of using the verification of the intermediate value theorem. So first verify the intermediate value theorem applies for this function on the interval from zero to one. So you need to show me those three requirements and I'm gonna look for them and you need to be very clear in your explanation. F of X, I can say that because that's the function's name and it's been named to that. F of X is continuous on the closed interval. And again, that's accepted. That's a polynomial function, we're good to go f of 0 does not equal f of 1. Plug these values in to your function and verify. And we're good to go. Negative 1 and 2. Yeah. And then our last step is we need to make sure that 0, that k value, is between. Is 0 between negative 1 and 2? Yes. It met all three requirements. By the intermediate value theorem, we are now guaranteed an answer. So if I set this function equal to zero, I am guaranteed an answer. And if you don't get an answer, you screwed something up because this theorem is going to work. So set it equal to zero, solve it, just use the quadratic formula here, negative b and so forth. Um, and you end up with negative 2.414 and 0.414. Notice I rounded three decimal places, always three decimal places. Now, I don't want, I don't, care about both of these answers. I only want the answer that's within the interval. And if you box both of those answers up, you're missing a point. Don't give me the point I don't care about. Just give me the number that's in the interval. And there it is. There's my guaranteed at least one answer. Okay, now I'm going to move this up. So verify that IVT, intermediate value theorem, applies in the indicated interval and find the value of C guaranteed by the theorems. This time we're working a little bit backwards, but first, all three steps, continuous on the closed, endpoints do not equal each other. My value, 4, is within there, within the interval. Set the function equal to 4. You can do your zeros. I did um, synthetic division here. Um, you can use your graphing calculator if you have a graphing calculator. <clears throat> Sorry, it cut off there at the end. These will be on Canvas. So once you find your, and then again, make sure you give me that x or c value that's within the interval. Okay, so um, please let me know if you have any questions. Just shoot me an email and make sure you're doing your homework and you're practicing. Thanks.